Colloquium is uh, one of the many activities we have been organizing as College of Sciences in celebration of Koch University's 25th anniversary. Uh, the first course at Koch University was given on October 4, 1993 by uh, Vehbi Koch, the founder of the university. And since then uh, we have come a long way uh, with significant achievements uh, which we can all be proud of. Uh, you must have seen uh, the email of our president uh, this morning. Uh, according to one uh, ranking in physical sciences, Koch University was uh, ranked uh, in the top 400. Um, one of the two universities, highest ranking Turkish, Turkish universities in physical uh, sciences. And I take this opportunity to congratulate you all and uh, um, thanks for all your contributions. Today's uh, colloquium speaker is uh, Professor Steve Granick. Steve is uh, the founding director of, um, interna uh, for Institute of Basic Science, Center for Soft and Living Matter in Ulsan, South Korea. Um, Steve uh, studied at Princeton University for undergraduate degree in a major that you may not guess. So I will not ask you. He studied sociology. Uh, then uh, he went for chemistry PhD to University of Wisconsin and he worked uh, with uh, Professor John Ferry. Uh, after PhD, he went to Paris uh, for as postdoctoral researcher and worked with uh, Pierre Gilles de Gen. Uh, de Gen received 1991 Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, and uh, he has been appointed as a faculty member at uh, Material Science and Engineering Department of uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I think after that, uh, Steve also spent some time with uh, Jacob Israel actually in Santa Barbara. That was before that. Okay. Uh, then I don't know the relation of uh, Steve uh, with Jacob Israel actually. Uh, but uh, they worked on similar uh, research topics. Now I mentioned these uh, names because um, uh, Ferry, Dejan, Israel, actually, you may not know them, but maybe you know their classical textbooks. Uh, Ferry, uh, Viscolasticity of Polymers, Dejan, among many textbooks, uh, many books, uh, Scaling Concepts in Polymer Physics, Israel actually intermolecular and surface forces. So if I have to summarize uh, Steve's scientific contributions in the first part of his career at Illinois, I will say viscoelasticity, scaling, and surface forces of molecules in confined spaces and at surfaces. Uh, then uh, he switched gears and his group contributed significantly to our areas uh, such as interaction of biological membranes, transport in living cells, and uh, self-assembly of Janus colloidal particles. Um, Steve spent 30 years at University of <coughs> Illinois before moving to South Korea, uh, and he was not only uh, the professor. He was not only prof professor of materials science and engineering, but professor of chemistry. Professor of Physics and Biophysics, Professor of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, something like this. So, uh, his interests have always been at the intersection of physics, chemistry, and biology. Uh, now, uh, I had to uh, look up my notes uh, for some uh, awards. Uh, Steve has received. Uh, he's a member of U.S. National Academy of Sciences and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And among the major awards, uh, APS Fellowship, Paris Sciences Medal, APS National Polymer Physics Prize, NSF Special Creativity Award, ACS National Colloid and Surface Chemistry Prize, and others. Now I have many anecdotes to tell about uh, Steve, but I will mention briefly a few. Um, so I think it was uh, early summer of 1992 when I talked to Steve to join his group. Uh, and uh, if he asked me what a polymer was, probably he wouldn't accept me to his group. 
But instead, he gave me the a book of Israel actually and said, read this. Uh, so uh, this is his attitude for group members. He looks uh, for potential for the future to read, understand, uh, evaluate, and create uh, individually. Um, he's practical in the lab. He will be surprised to hear this, I guess. Uh, but um, we were visiting Exxon for a joint project. And uh, the researchers there were, were unhappy uh, they set up the optical system, but uh, they don't have uh, a mechanical system to confine liquids down to nanometer, micrometer uh, thicknesses and control it. So Steve took a piece of mica, split it into two from one side, put a drop of liquid and squeezed it back, and then he gave it and said, here's a wedge. So uh, a very variable thickness, you can just move it in one direction. So uh, I guess they were happy. Um, and uh, finally, I took my PhD in less than four years in Steve's group. Not that uh, I was productive or uh, writing the best thesis, uh, but uh, I think he trusted me and supported uh, all the way through, which I'm grateful for. So today, I'm really happy to uh, introduce uh, Steve. Uh, he'll be talking on active materials, soft and living materials uh, that are out of equilibrium. Steve. Oh, thank you. Um, Levent, that was a, an obituary, I think. Uh, he very, he's always very polite. Um, did you catch the hidden meaning? Steve is a slow learner. It took him 30 years to graduate. <laughs> and finally, he graduated from his former university and went to a place in the other side of Asia, um, which is almost as beautiful as your splendid campus here. Um, this is one of the most beautiful places in the world, and your campus is one of the most beautiful places in one of the most beautiful places, and I hope you don't take it for granted because it really is splendid. So the future is always, in my mind, more important than the past. So Levent was telling us about the past, which I can barely remember. Um, this is a place where we have um, a big town nearby, uh, all the activity and bustle and turmoil of a big town, and the emptiness of mountainsides and brooks and the sun rising in the east and so forth. And we are seven professors. Um, oh, I'll tell you a story today about three things that we've been doing recently. Um, we're seven professors who are supported by the trust of the uh, government and the country where we live, they say, um, don't, you're not allowed to waste your time writing proposals. Um, we trust you that you would be able to write a proposal if you did, but we want you to work on science instead. And we'll give you what you need to do that science. Um, please don't waste it. So it's a great responsibility how to do justice to the kind of resources that they give to us. They put no pressure at all on us to be just a Korean institute. So in the end, about a third of us are Koreans, and the rest of us come from all countries. Not all, but many countries around the world. Um, the language is English. Um, that's why my Korean is so poor, because when I work, and I work too many hours of the day, I would never have a chance to speak the language of the country where I'm living. Here is the, so I told you there are seven uh, professors. Um, this is my subgroup. Uh, you can see they're an eclectic mi mixture of different people. Um, mostly postdocs, a couple of grad students. Um, people are increasingly coming on sabbatical. 
um, sometimes for a full year, sometimes just for a month or two. And I won't say they're always smiling, but um, they're not always crying either. It's hard to tell in that part of the world uh, just from the color of the hair what country someone is from. So I challenge you to say who's from Korea, who's from China, who's from, you know, different countries. So today I'll tell you a little bit about the partnership between these two. Uh, one of them started doing these experiments sort of as a, her idea and then they were talking over you know over coffee one day and the other said well you know maybe maybe I'd like to try to contribute as well and so in the end they they work together and kind of trade authorship and success of publications and this one I'll tell you a little bit and also her work um, we are equal opportunity though uh, we also accept men and so here is a problem larger than our own parochial interests, identified with um, an increasing number of people around the world. And if your name belongs here, I'm sorry. Um, this is, I didn't try to bring up the slide up to date last night. It's the people who look at living systems. And for example, this, uh, this video from YouTube these are bacteria swimming around, but you don't, if you, no matter how little you know about bacteria, if you look at these movies, you can sort of begin to think wh where the order here that leaps out to our eyes may be coming from, right? Just for geometrical reasons, as the bacteria swim around. So it's a type of problem that appeals to many people from different points of view, and it's very much in its infancy. People are struggling to find the right ways to think about it, uh, and yet it's accessible to many people because they can look at a movie like this and begin to think that they too can kind of see what the problem is here. And if you measure um, impact of the area in something like citations, you can see that the number of citations is growing uh, maybe exponentially with uh, each successive year. Um, it'll be even more when we come to the end of 2017. And this was uh, a couple of months back. So if that's what we should be thinking about, you may say, what is the problem that we should be thinking about? And some of you may know this famous painting by Gauguin. And this representation of Brownian motion of a particle being buffeted, a blue particle being buffeted by red water molecules, or sometimes in the air, I notice particles of dust will settle on my eyeglasses here, associated with thermodynamics that's such a powerful machinery to describe equilibrium. And the whole concept of thermal energy and enthalpy and free energy and, and so on. Not only in the 19th century, but also very strongly in the 20th century. Uh, for example, John Kahn in the US in NIST applied in many applications uh, these insights from thermodynamics and showed how they could lead to many, many um, sur surprisingly useful applications. Okay, but here we are in the 20th century, 21st century, and the world has changed. And it cannot be avoided to think about what happens out of equilibrium. Not just that guy, but also if you follow the Nobel Prizes. Uh, last year, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for a type of machine that we don't always think about, but increasingly we think about now because these can be made and people are starting to think how could one use them. 
people are increasingly aware that inside our body are molecular machines uh, without which we would be unable to live and go about and do their business so efficiently and so collectively and so in such a coordinated way that we don't understand well enough. Long ago people have been thinking about what does it mean to have something that's alive and part of the answer has been that life should replicate. Would it be possible in the inanimate world to have replication of itself? Well, people are beginning to find ways to do that. The so-called artificial cell of Albert Libchabé and his former students, the so-called fertilized colloids of various people who can coax even little spheres, uh, micron-sized spheres, to reproduce themselves. Or at the molecular scale, um, Sibren Otto. So for example, here's Sibren's video of small molecules self-assembling into rings. And then with time, the rings stacking together into columns, which grow and grow and eventually break, but then continue each of them separately to grow and grow and then to break. And by this hierarchical motif, make copies of themselves. So when you think about this, you find that in some way we are living a schizophrenic world. We have ourselves and all the cells that we may be interested in, where in a cubic micron there are about two million tiny machines. Or you may fly as I did a couple of days ago to Turkey at 30,000 feet in a machine that also has about the same number of parts but required half a million people to construct it. So there's a potential to create different kinds of machines that would be very useful if we knew how to do that and a, somehow a dichotomy. We're not somehow being self-consistent in our lives because we have on the one hand the one, hand, one kind and on the other hand the other kind of machine. They coexist without really benefiting each of them from the other. So it's, that's the context in which people are starting to talk about dynamic self-assembly. The number of citations here by the, I know we can argue this is not such a useful measure, but it's a measure. Um, the number is not very large yet, but again, the number, that number is growing every year. And again, we're not yet at the end of 2017, so it is continuing to grow proportionately. And we have an increasing number of cases where material, active materials are somehow demonstrating their existence so that you can't ignore them anymore. You have the so-called active pneumatics of Zvonimir Dojic. You have the so-called living crystals of pine and chakin where clusters grow because simply individual particles move quickly, but then they slow down when they form a cluster. And so the input is bigger than the output and the, cluster, and the crystal, the living crystal grows. We have the bird flocks I was admiring this morning along the Bosporus, along outside my, my hotel. And we have concepts which have no strict meaning at outside equilibrium like surface tension which physicists would fail their students if they applied them outside equilibrium and yet those same physicists do apply them to living materials anyway and find that it can be useful. 
and you start to you know think more about it the caffeine that many of us were drinking a few minutes ago if we just think about the atoms in the molecule um, it's not very helpful if we just look at the structure it's not very helpful the important thing to us about caffeine is what it makes us how it makes us feel after we drink it not like these cannonballs which we might see in a park and just looking at them we don't understand at all the use that our ancestors found for them in war. So intellectually, we, it's important to start thinking about systems of interacting components, about somehow making materials to be intelligent, to make decisions, to respond to options and do not a predetermined one result kind of outcome, but choose appropriately weighing the different considerations. And we do it as physical scientists. So there's this beautiful t uh, book by my, David, my friend David Chandler, who passed away recently, um, who some of you may study from it here, I don't know. Introduction to Modern Statistical Mechanics. Okay, if you write a book, never put modern in the title. Uh, this book was written 30 years ago. So how can we make progress without becoming biologists? It would make no sense to simply imitate what biologists are already doing much better than we would ever be able to do because they're the experts and we're trained in other things than that. So I'll tell you a little bit of, you know, just three short stories of things we've been doing recently and there's a lot more to do. One of them is simply, how do you look and observe? Um, something very ultra important is fluorescence microscopy, uh, which allows you to localize uh, even moving objects with the precision of a nanometer or so if you work hard at it. This happens to be a particular synthetic polymer molecule in an interesting liquid environment. But we see only the dye there. We don't see the molecule itself. The dye is rep reporting the presence of the invisible molecule to which it's attached. And you may know that uh, many people, although known not yet here at Koch, I understand, use transmission electron microscopy to observe entire structures with even better spatial resolution. The problem is that that doesn't, that requires a vacuum environment. So that if your interests are about molecules whose natural environment is a liquid, the experiment will just evaporate on you when you try to do it. People very recently have realized there's a trick to circumvent that and simply take a thin film of liquid and sandwich it between windows which are thin enough that they won't uh, uh, consume too much of the electron beam and, uh, and, and disrupt the electron beam too badly. And they've shown that you can image nanoparticles in liquid in this way. And even more than that, they can improve on the windows, making them even smaller by having graphene, just a one or two, not one, but two or three or four graphene sheets thick and image have uh, even thinner uh, films of liquid that way. So remember I started showing you the, the pair of scientists who work together, um, Manasa, the girl from India. She said, maybe we can do that with individual molecules. And Juan, the lady, who got her PhD in the US, but she's Chinese, uh, said, let's look at polymers, synthetic polymers. And any reasonable person who knew anything uh, useful about this technique would know that that was a bad idea because electrons would destroy the sample 
uh, there'd be no hope of seeing uh, the difference between the liquid and these organic molecules which are so close chemically to the liquid. But they just tried anyway. So here's an example of what they're able to do. You see a, a growing bubble which is um, um, created by the experiment for some reason, um, sweeping individual molecules of here, polystyrene sulfonate maybe, or polyethylene oxide, I forgot. Sweeping the molecules forward. In the beginning we weren't sure, was it some kind of molecular sized dust? And they did many exper control experiments, convinced themselves and me that no, it's really, it's truly molecules. And they learned that their naive notion of doing it here in this system actually wasn't so stupid after all because since they were using graphene windows, they, it turns out graphene is an effective scavenger of the products that are so de otherwise so deleterious um, in, um, in ripping apart the samples. And the point is they can pursue their interests in dynamical phenomena, how things change with time. They can see these particular molecules, their conformations fluctuating. Um, of course, the true fluctuations must be faster than this. These fluctuations are at the frame rate of the particular detector we have. And because Manasa comes from a physics background, she's very, it's in her blood, it's instinctive to her to quantify everything and to acquire huge data sets, not of one molecule, but of hundreds of different molecules. So for example here, you can see the distribution of sizes that the two of them measure under different conditions with a lot of salt, with less salt, a higher molecular weight, a lesser molecular weight, and so on. So the proof of principle is there. And even chemical reactions. Um, we would prefer that these chemical reactions not take place, but they do occasionally. They're what we read about in the textbooks, that polymer molecules may recombine uh, after they separate, or they may separate in the process called scission. And well, there's no new science in observing it, but it kind of feels good to be able to observe it and not just to write, not just to draw cartoons about it. So another kind of experiment that someone else in the lab was doing, um, she's a chemist by training, a physical chemist, and of course we know about chemical reactions and the usefulness of that. And we know about catalysis and the usefulness of that. And in my mind, it was always that on the one hand, there's catalysis and chemistry. And on the other hand, there are things like Brownian motion and directed motion of bacteria and so on. And both of them are deep, profound subjects, each of them worthy of study, but with no link between them, I thought. But she had more insight than I, so she took a particular enzyme. This is the one with which she started, which has the function of catalyzing the hydrolysis of urea. Very simple elementary reaction. And she studied it. Okay, there's no way to visualize it one molecule by one molecule that I know of. So her indirect way was to label with a fluorescent dye the enzyme so that as she saw the dye migrate through space, she knew the enzyme was migrating. And then by this technique called fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, you can simply illuminate a certain narrow hourglass shape. And as the dye labeled enzyme moves through, you see a burst of higher intensity of fluorescence for some time that you measure, and then it's gone, and then a new molecule arrives for some time, and then it's gone. And so the raw data is this noise that tells you how fast the enzyme is moving. 
And you can do it with the normal diffraction limited confocal microscopy that's very easy and standard. Or you can do it using super resolution techniques that, that we have and look then in narrow and na narrow, more and more narrow windows of observation. So she set out to do that. And here, for example, the enzyme, she's measuring in the standard analysis, you measure a correlation, what's called a correlation function. Uh, don't worry about that. If the data goes through the lines, then it fits the standard model of just a Brownian diffusion. So for the standard large confocal windows, it goes through the lines and it is diffusive, except, and this sounds wrong, but it's what she observed and she doesn't, you know, never occurred to her, I think, to pretend that she didn't observe what she observed. When the substrate is there, when the reactant is being chewed up, the diffusion, the curve shifts to the left. The whole process is faster, which tells us that the diffusion of the enzyme is faster when it's catalyzing the reaction. And when she went to an even smaller window of observation with the super resolution tricks, it again becomes faster. It should be faster because, um, because the, the space being traversed is smaller. But now it doesn't go through the, the dotted lines anymore. It's not diffusive. Even the character of the motion is not diffusive. So if you explore more systematically at the large window size and change the concentration of the reactants of the substrates, the diffusion coefficient apparently is growing the higher the concentration of the substrate. Okay. It's not clear that that is possible physically, but it's what she observes. And if you go to the smaller window size, where you remember on the left it doesn't fit through the dotted lines, so you, it's not legitimate to analyze it as a diffusion coefficient, so what she chooses to do instead is simply to measure, plot out the, the histogram of times it takes for her dilabeled enzymes to wander through the window. And that's what you see, the histogram of different times to wander through the window. And it's not a single peak, right? It's bimodal. There's a relatively fast and a relatively slow peak. The relatively slow peak turns out to be diffusive in the sense that it scales with time as you expect for diffusion. And the relatively fast peak does not scale with time as it should for diffusion. So the relatively fast peak actually scales with time as it should for a car moving on the highway, for ballistic motion. So we presume to infer an effective and apparent ballistic speed. So we don't think that it's going in one direction like on a straight highway. We believe it's you know, meandering around. But we have no information about how it meanders. So to keep it simple, don't introduce extra assumptions for which there's no support. Just imagine it's in. So calculate an apparent speed. It, that becomes less and less the larger the observation window size. If you extrapolate to zero speed, it's zero at the regular confocal volume, so that's consistent. If you look at those different fractions, what fraction of the whole process is relatively fast? What fraction is relatively small? Plot that versus the window size on the bottom. You can see that um, most of it's diffusive by the size, by the time you have the regular confocal size. But if you extrapolate to closer to the size of the enzyme itself, then more than half of it is active, is ballistic, is directed. So we don't believe that the, even the diffusive part is truly diffusive. We think that what we measure for the large windows is ballistic motion, 
change of orientation, ballistic motion, change of orientation, and so on. And those of you who've studied bacteria are familiar with this. It's the so-called run and tumble motion of bacteria when they sense food, for example. Now, isn't it lovely that these tiny engines, these molecules, somehow have built into them this action so that without, they're able to make these decisions that uh, the biochemical machinery of a bacterium can make, but without having that biochemical machinery, simply from the physical laws that somehow lead to creating this ballistic motion. So this excites us a lot and we're working hard um, to follow up in many directions. So we see it, of course, with other enzymes. We see it tentatively um, with other kinds of chemical reactions, for sure with the polymerization of actin. Um, we see confirmation of the fact that it's an active driven motion because if we look at um, the impact of the sort of the hydrodynamics of the moving molecules on spectator passive molecules nearby, they're buffeted by that motion. Why is not yet clear. Um, there are many guesses why it may be. It may have to do with conformational changes driven by the catalysis. It may have to do with the free energy differences of the reaction. There may be other things. Um, that, that remains to be seen, but if we accept it as an observation that we believe, then the consequences are slowly becoming clear. Another example is with very simple, even simpler particles, just little pieces of glass, silica, little pieces of latex that have, whose only virtue is that uh, chemists know how to make them to be extremely monodisperse and for the exchange of a small amount of money, we too can have samples. And then we go on to preserve the geometrical simplicity of these spheres, but impart some shape that's chemical. And again, we try to keep it simple, so we follow the example of our predecessors who lived in this part of the world. So here we have the, the Roman god Janus, who had two faces, and we give a two faces to our particles as well. You'll see in a moment what they are. Now, as you know, living in a different part of the world now, um, I live with people who say, well, we had that idea first before the Romans. And it's also, of course, the yin-yang idea. Now, how can we then explore questions of collective behavior? How can we begin to bring life to these individual beads and study how they interact? So the way we choose to do that is to put the beads in water, uh, let them sediment to the bottom of a microscope slide, apply an electric field vertically in an alternating way, so, and on half of the beads, we'll coat a very thin layer of metal so that when we apply the electric field, this half-coated sphere will stand up with the equator pointing upwards. Usually it's nickel with an adhesion layer of titanium. And then the oscillating electric field, and this is a kind of little bit complicated, um, acts upon ions in the water. Now, the metal side is more polarized by the electric field, so the ions in the water respond more on the metal side than they do on the silica dielectric side, they, even though they do respond on both sides, but more so on the metal sides, and that creates a, like a jet engine, a push that propels the particles. And here they are being propelled. So there's nothing interesting about this particular motion except to show you that it is propulsion. So these size particles, you know, two or three microns in diameter, 
on this time scale would, hard, would almost sit still if you were just measuring their Brownian motion. Here they're moving far faster than that because of the electric field induced uh, active motion. So then you start to wonder, you know, what, how can we use that? So here, for example, is um, one single, you know, one lonely active particle moving through a bath, or several, I guess, um, interloping, moving through a bath of passive particles that don't have metal at all. And you can see a wake left behind. If you didn't know what the system was, you might think you, that you knew. You might think that we made a mistake and there was a bacterium loose in this sample. But I promise you that's not what's happening. What about social behavior? So here is under slightly different conditions, again, the passive background and more active particles. And what might seem to your eyes to be the emergence of some social coordinated behavior. But you know what the system is. You know that there can be no thinking involved here. It's simply the particles finding the most facile way to display their activity in these spaces of limited size. And Levent, I know, lived in the Netherlands and he, I think, is already reminded of the following famous painting of prisoners when they exercise. They're given a few precious moments to stretch their legs. And it's not that they love to follow each other, but that the only way to move from spot to spot is to follow each other. And we can see it here in the inanimate world. What about polymerization? If we change the frequency of our alternating electric fields, we actually have, are able to tune the interactions between the two sides of the Janus particle. So here, with an appropriate frequency, we can create a slight attraction between the heads and the tails of the moving particles. So, of course, there then follows, there then ensues polymerization. Huh? Is it real data or simulation? Is it real data or simulation? Okay, let's guess. Let's see what the audience thinks. <laughs> I mean, I assume it's real, but it looks like a simulation. <laughs> okay, so you understand the charm of working with collides. They, they behave themselves. Experiments don't go that wrong very often. And it is real, I promise you. And, and I promise you they do go wrong um, also. Um, no, this is, this is honest, right? This is not, the answer is not programmed into this. We didn't know what was gonna happen until we did the experiment. Now, you may say, what's moving here? Um, this is not moving in space, but with this resolution of this crummy video, um, we can't see it moving, but it's rotating. It's just not getting anywhere. This is a relatively slow, a relatively low concentration. You can see, of course, the few chains that um, did not um, manage to bite their, the ends of the moving chain to the forward part of the moving chain and form a, a ring. So you can go on and quantify all this, um, and that's interesting, but probably not for this diverse audience. And you can um, look with a better resolution and see particle by particle what happens as they move. There's no preference for clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, that's simply chance. But once it starts moving, rotating in one of those directions, it will continue in one of those directions. And you can again see the linear chains that haven't managed to make peace with the world um, by, by forming a closed loop. And to me, the most 
visually compelling is the very high concentration uh, situation where they're so concentrated that they're always banging into each other. So transiently, yes, they will form loops. And transiently, yes, they will form well-defined chains. But it won't last long because some other loop and some other chain will bang into it and break it up. And then the whole process will start again. So to me, it's visually appealing because there's that sort of incipient order that attracts the eye but not so much order that you quickly catch it and then you're bored because you know the answer because uh, it doesn't last long enough. Something else similar but not quite the same continues. And of course, I guess if we were go to go to Taksim on Sunday or Friday or something, we might see a similar situation. So we have these very simple algorithms, simply head and tail of the moving particles and the dipoles induced by the electric fields and the different permutations of interactions that are allowed by those two dipoles each on each, each on, on, on each particle separately. We can dial in according to the frequency different options and for example here if it's moving in a certain direction and repels as it moves at that head. So that sounds a bit abstract. Um, let's see what it means in practice. They come together by chance and they're moving in that direction and they at the same time as they move they repel. It's like some bad movie, right? Strangers in the night. Now, what happens if we raise the concentration of such moving particles where this is the elementary interaction? They can't get away from each other, but they repel, and so they end up swarming. And this might remind you of the schools of fish that we all see in aquaria and may enjoy eating um, sometimes. So here we have a swarm coming in from the right, crashing, if you will, on the shore, eating up some of the other particles that previously were not part of the moving wave, but subsume it into that moving wave. Now, Think about it for a moment. This swarm that's coming in from the right uh, simply nucleated and moved in that direction by chance. Maybe somewhere else in the sample another swarm formed and moves in. And at some point they're going to crash and come together. So what will that look like? is as if we saw waves crashing and eddies forming when the waves touch each other and all the ensuing hydrodynamics. But from such a simple logic that I tried to explain to you, how to teach these particles to move in one direction and to repel each other. Here's a final state that we don't fully understand but it turns out that in the final stages these swarms eventually um, are very likely to form vortices. So here we have different vortices um, that are not talking to each other very much. Uh, there are certain rules about which way, which allowed, ro which rotations, directions of rotation are allowed when the vortices are close together. You can struggle very hard and make big vortices. So here's the biggest one that the student managed to make. Now, you may say, what about the dirt there? The little particles of metal that came off uh, because of the electric fields. Um, why didn't you do a better job of removing that dirt? And maybe it's responsible. So actually, the story there is that this is not 
a lot of dirt. This is as little as was possible to get. There are many other examples of much more dirt than this. And when I understood that the movies the student was showing to me always had this dirt in it, I realized that this is data I should always trust because he would never select the movies to remove the stuff that shouldn't be there. He would always simply say, well, this is what the experiment showed, that you, you know, take it or leave it, but this is what nature is doing. So I knew to always trust that data. And then, because we needed so much help to understand the rules behind this motion, we ended up collaborating very closely with my friend Eric Lauten, who does computer simulations. And he was able to see very similar behavior. And we were quite sure that in his computer simulation there was no dirt. So that's the way it worked. I learned a lot about computer simulation here. Um, the hardest part was to find that the, the yeah. Number of the vortex is increasing. Sorry? Is the number of vortexes increasing or do you have constant, uh, constant number of vortexes in these dynamics? We didn't explore in great detail enough to answer your question. Uh, um, the question was, how, is, is the number of vortices changing? Well, yeah, in the beginning it's zero. And in the end here, it's some number. But whether, you know, what happens at very long times, we just don't know. Um, that would be hard because it's hard to keep the experiment going as long as you would wish it to go. Um, it was very hard to find the parameters to simulate where you, both sides could be, could have high confidence that the computer was simulating, was being faithful to the experiment and yet not being too faithful. It was abstracting the essence of the problem. So I used to, you know, my student was called Jing. This was work done at Illinois. And uh, Eric Lauten's student was called Ming. So I would hear Jing screaming into Skype, uh, talking to Ming sometimes. And I would say, you know, why were you so upset last night with, with Ming? And he said, no, 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 that's just the way we talk in Shanghai. So they finally agreed, and they did their, their comparison experiments in the two ways. And you see the swarm, the gas, if you will, the chains. And you see on the computer now, because we trust the, the model on the computer, we see that it's not restricted just to the two-dimensional situation that in the lab we don't know how to go beyond. Even in three dimensions, we see more or less the same thing. So what do we learn from this kind of work? Um, I would say we know many things, so many things in our world in which we reside are not at equilibrium. But when we go to school, we're taught to forget about that because it's too hard to think about out of equilibrium. It's such a messy problem, we're taught. There's every out of equilibrium situation will be different from every other, we're taught. And if you want to do real natural science, you shouldn't think about it. But I've tried to give you three examples of the first paths that we, among many others around the world, are taking to say, can we do better? Can we search and begin to find more useful generalizations about these problems? And I'm very hopeful about that. And every time Levent and other people looks back with pride to the Nobel Prize for Dijen in 1991, who coined the word soft matter even earlier, I feel some dismay because that was a long time ago. And I know there is an increase, the feeling along by many people that because it was so long ago, it's no longer so fresh as, as it was. It's a mature subject. And all we can hope to do now in the 21st century, in the second decade of the 21st century, is just kind of harvest what those guys knew and find the applications. And I disagree. Uh, to me, there are 
wherever you look for them, you find surprises. And the way you find the surprises are by doing experiments that are different from what those previous people had done. So the examples in this talk have come from microscopes of different kinds and computers which we need to analyze the vol huge volumes of data that these new microscopes give to us. And there are many other new techniques, simulations, and many others in addition to that. So we can do things. We have access to all kinds of experimentation that the older people simply probably never occurred to them and certainly were not capable of doing. And when we apply those new capabilities, we're not smarter than they were, but we simply have experiments, interrogations that they could not do, and we find some ways in which they were absolutely correct and nothing needs to be changed, and other ways in which they overlooked some things, including some problems that they had not thought about. So let me, one of my goals in coming here is to show you uh, what you too might be interested to do if one day some of you come to visit us and perhaps spend some time with us. This is my research group five years ago. And I know I looked younger at that time. That's the way the world turns. What becomes of people who embark on this kind of research in this spirit? What good is it? And I would say, you know, what good it will be in form the sense of producing products that will be sold in stores, I don't know. But it's been really useful to students who work on these problems. So this guy today is not a student. He has his own students. This guy, again, he was just a kind of he looks like a goof-off. He was never a goof-off, but now he's more sober because he has to worry about his students in Japan at Kyushu University. She graduated from the University of Illinois, went off to do a postdoc at Berkeley, came back to the same department where she got her diploma, and now in a sense replaces me at the University of Illinois, even though she's so young. He's a professor at, in Korea and so on. There's a story behind all of these people and I would argue the question what good is research for? Well it should be good to the people doing the research and it generally is. So in my new institution in Korea, here I am older, here's a guy who looks very kind of dreamy, right? What do you think his specialty is? Theory, <laughs> simulation. Here's a guy who looks more determined. He left Northwestern University to join us. He was a full professor there. You know, chemistry in its largest interpretation of the word. Microfluidics, nanomedicine, this is the only guy I know who understands immunology just as well as physics, and physics just as well as biology. Uh, he left the Curie Institute in Paris to join us. This guy, John King, is an American whose work is so interdisciplinary and I wouldn't even know how to pigeonhole him. So I encourage you, if some of you one day don't know what to do, um, browse on the web and take a look at our homepage. Thank you. We may take some questions uh, you may have. Welcome. Yeah. Um, it was very interesting, first of all. Thank you. Uh, it, the, the colloids uh, that, oh, okay. The, 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 the behavior of those colloids, which uh, also form vertices, etc., uh, was very interesting. Uh, but in, in addition to electrostatic interactions, don't you have to worry about hydrodynamics when you model them? Ah, what about hydrodynamics? That's the reflexive question. Um, and let me give you a very um, 
um, simple-minded answer. I, I don't, I can only speculate about the experiment, but what we can do is go on the computer and tell the computer, take out the hydrodynamics and what will happen. And what will happen is what I showed you. Okay. So hydrodynamics appears to be a second order effect for these situations, period. Let me follow up that question. Yeah. So one of the videos that you showed like, was like the traffic in India. Uh, it's chaotic, but they never collide. Mm -hmm. Or they co co collide, but they move very fast. So uh, is the repulsion, uh, are they, uh, as they come closer, are they rotating <coughs> to repel each other? I wondered whether it's the hydrodynamic field uh, that they are <coughs> communicating yeah. at yeah. long distance or the electric field. Uh, so why don't they collide and uh, attract each other? So co hydrodynamics may contribute in the experiments, but in the, the computer modeling shows us that if you have only the dipolar interactions, it's enough. Okay? So I guess I don't, ha having seen that correspondence, I don't worry too much. Um, I simply take that as, you know, what the world tells us and move on to other kinds of problems. Estimate? I was going to ask that question, but mm -hmm. uh, when we look at the ion traps, when we put charged particles into some kind of a trap, we see similar type of motion mm -hmm. in it. But over there, we also know a lot of it comes from the boundary effects. So mm -hmm. depend on what kind of boundary, but that boundary effect may be very long range. Mm -hmm. And so did you see anything uh, related to that in experiment or simulation? That's an interesting problem. We haven't looked for it, um, and it would be interesting to introduce boundaries. Um, in the experiments, the boundaries are far away from, you know, uh, on the scale that I was showing you, they were off at the edge of the world, so I don't think so. Um, and on the computer with, um, with um, periodic boundary conditions, same, same kind of thing. So, but it would be interesting to introduce on purpose and then see what new physics would then be introduced. Because they de depend on how you set up your trap. Yeah. Then whether it's a, it's a circular trap or a different trap, you get different yeah. structures and different kind of uh, dynamics. Yeah, that's certainly true. And, and I guess we saw a little bit of that when, when I showed you <laughs> mixing passive particles so that the active ones kind of segregated into empty spots and ended up being confined in those spots. So that's a variation of what you're asking about. There would be much more to do in that direction than we took the time to do. That's always the problem. Um, you find surprises and, and there's more than you than time available to follow up on it. So I just trust the people who work with me and they follow what they care about and the student working on this, well, her interests lay elsewhere, and she took the pretty movies and, in depth, looked at other problems. Thanks for your nice presentation. I had a question about uh, when you talk about the active matters. Is it uh, especially for like? The molecules uh, are uh, in the biological system, like organic matters, materials, or it can be extended to different kinds of materials. For example, and you uh, you show that the pathways. Yeah, no, not just biological. Um, I showed you examples that were not at all biological. Of course. Um, we can often be inspired, and our imagination can be guided by watching what happens, what evolution has produced for us, but need not be. No, need not, need not at all be. So, for example, the, the, what, how the, the transmutation of, of the free energy of reaction by an enzyme partly into the product and it seems partly into motion, I expect that will be more general and not restricted to enzyme catalysis. So we're working hard on that, but um, too soon to know for sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I'll come to the last uh, question. 
maybe a little bit of a detail, but uh, also um, these self-avoiding walks and self-avoiding loops yeah. sort of pictures was also very interesting. Mm. So uh, uh, because the environment is crowded, or when it is crowded, do you see, you know, these self-avoiding walks behave like random walks, you know, there are all these kind of things. I and mean, do you see those kind of statistics in these systems at all, or maybe they are too small? For we need a different language than, than has been, than that wonderful language developed for equilibrium systems. So that becomes a long discussion. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Professor Granik once more.